The Lord be with you. We welcome you to Zion today as we gather for worship. Always a joy to be with you and to celebrate 
Uh, today is a special day for us, not just to be in worship, but to welcome our guests. Uh, they have the distinction of coming from the farthest away today, uh, from Taiwan. This is uh, Professor Oliver and his family, uh, Maggie and Isaac and Gary and Jenny. Uh, we are so honored to have you with us today. Uh, it's such a, such a joy to be in partnership and ministry with you. And I know you'll talk more about this later, Professor Oliver, but we've been uh, supporting you for over 20 years, I believe. Yeah, so, uh, uh, and watch you go from a single man to married and children, and what a joy to celebrate that journey with you. Uh, Zion, what a, what a privilege it is for you to be partners in ministry uh, with our missionary, Professor Stephen Oliver in Taiwan. He'll be sharing the message today. He'll be sharing the children's sermon in a few minutes when we get to that point in the service. And uh, taking some time to teach in Bible class about what God is doing uh, in Taiwan and how you're making that happen. And then we have a potluck after that. So uh, we invite you to stay around and uh, enjoy some food together and get to know the Olivers a little bit more. And I think, is it tomorrow you take off back for Taiwan? Is that? Wow, wow. That's a, that's a big trip, isn't it? Yeah, so God bless you in that journey. Thank you so much for making Zion uh, one of your stops. We are honored to have you here. A couple other quick announcements. Uh, I would ask you, to, uh, when you leave today, out on the table in the fellowship hall, there's a little postcard like this, and it has the information on the Olivers, and this is a great prayer card. So what we do in our house, this is a suggestion maybe for you, to make sure that we are praying for all the people we promised to pray for, we have a little box. We call it our prayer box. And we simply rotate through every day a different person or group in our prayer box. And your, your card comes up every several days, and we pray for the Oliver family. Uh, so this is a great way uh, to remember that, or put it on your fridge or someplace where you can see it, to be in prayer for the Oliver family. So take one of these with you, and, and you can be in prayer for our, our partners in ministry, the Oliver family. Okay, uh, one other, or two other things. One, I want to offer a special word of welcome, and I, you've seen them here the last several weeks. They have transferred their membership here to Zion Keith and Tanya Benna back here. I'm not making any speech. I know a little wave. That was good, a little wave. Um, so, so that you know, to kind of make the connection, um, um, Tanya's parents were Roger and Deanna Hagedorn. So there you make that connection. Ah, that's, that's the connection. They live in Ida Grove. Uh, and so today you don't have the distinction of being the farthest away. Today the Olivers get that. But they do make the effort to drive down, and uh, we're so glad to welcome you here to Zion. Okay, the last thing I have for you, and um, I've been announcing this the last several weeks, but I'll keep doing it because I want us to practice this. Do you see on the back bottom, it says, what's your one thing? Okay, the new tradition we're starting here at Zion, it's very simple. During the service, at some point, in, the, in a hymn, in, the, in something in the liturgy, a Bible reading, something from the sermon, even the children's message, your goal is to take one thing home with you, one thing. If you take more, wonderful, take more. But one thing, and write it down. You don't have to turn it in to me, but you're going to take it home, and this is going to be something you can share during the week, like we've talked about before. Maybe you share it over lunch. What was your one thing? We do this at the Connor household. Everybody's got to go around the table and say, here was my one thing. It's a great way for doing Bible study as a family. Read the section of text. What was your one thing? What did you hear? And I would love for us to get in the habit during our fellowship time, as we're talking about how much rain we got, which is good to know. We're always praying for rain. But also say, what was your one thing? And it's a great way of introducing a conversation. So I encourage you to write down your one thing. And you know what? I actually had pencils to put in the pews this morning, and I forgot to. So you have to share pencils and pens. Uh, but we do have, hopefully by next week, I'll remember to have them in the pew. Okay, so please do your one thing, and the other announcements are there for you in your worship folder. Take time to look over those so you can be part of the life of Zion. Okay, we're ready to turn to our first song.
We stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Do you believe that you are a sinner? Yes, I believe it. I am a sinner. How do you know this? From the Ten Commandments, which I have not kept. Are you sorry for your sins? Yes, I am sorry that I have sinned against God. What have you deserved from God because of your sins? His wrath and displeasure, temporal death, and eternal damnation. Do you hope to be saved? Yes, that is my hope. In whom then do you trust? In my dear Lord Jesus Christ. What has Christ done for you that you trust in him? He died for me and shed his blood for me on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Let us then confess our sins to God, asking him to forgive us for Christ's sake. I, a poor sinner, plead guilty before God of all sins. I have lived as if God did not matter and as if I mattered most. My Lord's name I have not honored as I should. My worship and prayers have faltered. I have not let his love have its way with me, and so my love for others has failed. There are those whom I have hurt and those whom I have failed to help. My thoughts and desires have been soiled with sin. I am sorry for all of this and ask for grace. I want to do better. Do you believe that the forgiveness I speak is not my forgiveness, but God's? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. In the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, and for all people according to their needs. For the faithful proclamation of Christ's saving name, that God's people may be strengthened in the true faith and his kingdom extended, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy, for the holy Christian church throughout the world and for all who confess the name of Christ, that God would guard and defend us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy, for this congregation, its mission, and its people for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who have wandered from the faith, that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For the government and all who have been set into positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of the people. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts, and sciences, that God would grant them skill and integrity in the performance of their responsibilities and valued service through their vocations. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them 
Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful and generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides to support the church and to help those in need, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who are sick, that God would grant healing to their bodies and strength to bear their infirmities with patience and grace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who mourn, that in their time of sorrow they would not lose hope, but rely on God's promise that he will never leave them or forsake them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Our Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For you, to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Blessed Lord, since you have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55. This is where the Lord promises that his word will not return void. It will produce a harvest, essentially. And you'll hear Jesus kind of pick up on this theme in his parable of the sower, which we'll get to in our gospel reading, the promise that indeed his word will produce fruit. We begin with verse number 10. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We continue through the book of Romans. We're in the middle of chapter 8 this week. Chapter 8 is such a remarkable chapter. There's just so much meat in this uh, section of the book of Romans. I certainly commend the whole chapter to you. But Paul's going to be speaking here in the first part of the book of, of chapter 8 and then our section on this idea of living according to the flesh or according to the spirit. And in this context, according to the flesh would be another way of talking about our sinful inclinations or our sinful desires. Will we run after them? Or will we run after or give heed to God's Spirit? And this is the, the tension, the battle that we will experience as confessors of Christ because the temptation will be to follow after that flesh. So Paul will begin here in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him. In order that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of the Lord Thanks be to God. Two more reflections on that before we stand for our alleluia. I want you, number one, to hear this idea of following the passions of the flesh, Paul says, leads to death. And it's not simply talking about physically, physically dying, although that certainly may be a part of it. It leads to death in relationships. It leads to death in mental well-being. It leads to death in... Um, financial well-being. It leads to all kinds of death and disaster in our life. And what Paul is saying is, if we choose to part from this way of the Spirit, this way, which initially may not seem so, such a big deal, but it will eventually lead to all kinds of heartache and sorrow and grief. And so Paul is saying for us is to walk on this path with God's Spirit, which is the way of life and joy and peace that passes all understanding. And second, he calls us heirs, inheritors with Christ of the kingdom of God. That is scarcely conceivable. You are an inheritor of the kingdom of God. 
That means nothing you gain here can add to that, and nothing you lose here can take away from that, because you are an inheritor of the kingdom. And that helps in our following and our obedience to the Spirit, because we realize nothing the world has to offer is going to outdo the promise that God gives to us in Christ. We stand and we sing together our Alleluia and verse. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We're reading a selected text here. We're actually cutting out a center section, which if I had more time I would talk about. But in that center section, Jesus talks about why he tells parables. So we'll have to leave that for now. Jesus is going to tell the parable and then interpret it. So we begin with verse number one. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path. And the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. We skip now to Jesus' interpretation of the parable. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Kids, you can come on up. And Professor Oliver, Pastor Oliver, we invite you forward as well. Kids, come on up and find a seat. It depends on what I'm doing. So if you can sit if you want or stand, whichever you feel more comfortable doing. That's just fine. Come on up and find a seat. Always so happy to have you here. And I'm really happy to introduce my friend. And he's also a pastor. He's on the other side of the world. I mean, it's pretty much the yeah, other side of the world. It is, yeah. uh, Taiwan is a long, long way from here. And uh, I think I've told you this before. I was actually in Taiwan. Oh. Years ago on a choir tour for college. Oh, sure. So it's a well, beautiful country. It's right. a beautiful country. So I'm Great. so excited to introduce to you Pastor Stephen Oliver. Uh, he te teaches there at, uh, well, a college, a seminary. China Lutheran Seminary. A seminary sure. there in Taiwan. He's going to talk about that and share a little bit with you. So go ahead. Okay, great. I I'm, I'm really think we have a privilege today. I definitely do. And that's that Catherine is playing the organ and I think she's the youngest organist for this big a church that I've seen. Do you know how old she is? She's 13, right? And my daughter, Ginny, is almost 12, and then I have son 14. So she's right in between them. And they're going to share some music a little bit later. And that's a great way to serve God. 
But let me talk about another way. I'm wondering, does, does anybody ever have homework here from school that your teacher gives you homework? Um, maybe some that are young don't have homework yet, but others have homework. And as you get older and older, you have homework, more homework. And one time I asked my older son, I said, do you have any homework now? And he said, oh, yeah, but um, no problem. I can still play video games because it's not due for three days. Did you ever think about that? That did that ever happen to you? You you had some homework and you just waited till the last minute to do it and had fun first, right? And then you just play a lot and then when it's time to do the homework, maybe you do it really fast and the teacher says, oh, this is not such good homework. It's not done well. So we procrastinate. Well, one time Jesus said something similar to this that I wanted to share with you guys and that's where in John 4, 35, Jesus said, you have a saying that there's not going to be the harvest for four more months. Do you guys know what harvest is? In the corn and bean fields, of course, everybody knows harvest, getting the beans and the corns in. And um, he said, you all have a saying, it's all four more months to harvest. In other words, we can procrastinate and wait, right? Three more days till my homework, right? Four more months till harvest, he said. But he said, look up, look up now. The field is ready for harvest. And do you think he's talking about corns and beans? No. Anybody know what he's talking about? What? That's right. She got it right. She said, I think he's talking about sharing the word of God. Because he often uses, just like the parable about the seeds, that um, seeds and plants are like God's word growing in people's life. So what he means is, you need to go out there now and spread the gospel. Don't wait. And um, I want to encourage each one of you, just like you see Catherine serving today, every one of you can serve. And what I want you to think about is right now in your time of history, the time that you're living, the Chinese world is ripe. The Chinese world is ripe. I'll share more about that but in the sermon. But they are ready to receive the gospel like never before in history. Do you think you could go be a missionary to Chinese? Can you, can you go be a missionary to Chinese? You can. I hope you will. That's like going around the other side of the world, drilling a hole through the earth, and then going down there to, to China. I hope you will. So what I want to do is ask, um, except for Jeannie, because she can speak um, Chinese, she can speak Mandarin. Can anybody else speak Mandarin? Chinese? Can you speak that? No? Okay, I want to teach you. Okay, I want you to say the first word in Chinese. Shan. Okay, let's all say that. Shan. Do you know what that word is? It's God. You have to say it with the uptone. Shan. Let's say it again. One, two, three. Shan. Okay, the next word is I. You say it down tone. Okay, let's say that. I. Okay, that means loves. God loves. Okay, who does he love? And I'll say that last word. Shiran. Can you say that? Shiran. Okay, let's say that all together. Shan I Shiran. Okay? Shan I Shiran. Okay, one more time. Shan I Shiran. Wow, you Chinese is already good. Do you know the first sentence you learned in Chinese is God loves the world? From John 3.16. It's the first verse I memorized in Chinese. And if you go anywhere and learn another language and learn to be a missionary, I hope you first learn that verse and share it with a lot of people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. Okay, thank you. You can go on back. Thank you, boys and girls. You return to your seats. Thank you, uh, Pastor Oliver. I, sure. I'll share with you like, this because you'll find this amusing. So Catherine is 13, and uh, this congregation, they're pretty used to young kids playing on the organ, aren't you? Uh, <laughs> Timothy, our oldest, started when he was 11. Wow. And do you That's... know what we called him? 
What? The invisible organist. <laughs> Why you, is that? Because when you set out here, you couldn't see a head at all. <laughs> so you, it looked like it played itself. <laughs> so uh, well, we're, we, and uh, Zion is still blessed to have many young musicians. So uh, they do serve in so many unique capacities, and we're so grateful for that. Great. Thank you, Catherine, for playing yeah. today. And speaking Thank of you, playing, yeah. how about we sing our next hymn? Very okay. good. Thank you. invite you forward, Professor Oliver. Thank you. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to share as a sermon text today, the Isaiah 55, um, verses 1 through, five, through um, 13, the whole chapter, actually, um, we just read a few verses, and let me go through that and then share about how this applies to our work in the Chinese world. And I really want to say a deep-hearted thank you to all of you. Um, as Pastor said, you've been supporting me over 20 years, 23 years now. And I can still remember when I was a single guy about 20 years ago, staying in Warren and Sue Puck's house just down the road, and their neighbor, Tom, the veterinarian, took me out to do something that really impressed this city boy. He was doing a sperm count on bulls, and he had to go do that, and, you know, and just everything about that just really um, made a big impression on me. So um, I have good memories here. We've been here a number of times and seen a lot of you, and maybe some of you um, are, were a little bit new to but thank, thank the Lord for your support. And just as I encourage the children, I believe missionaries will come out of this congregation. 
And if um, Zion is willing to support this guy who is a pastor way down in Des Moines area, I know they will support their own congregational um, children coming up to be missionaries. Um, I grew up in the Missouri Synod churches, and that's what really inspired me is when the missionaries visited, and of course our pastors as well. So um, let me read through these um, verses, Isaiah 55. Um, okay, let me, let me turn here. Okay, Isaiah 55, 1 through 5. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live and I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. Behold, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you shall call a nation you do not know, and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Um, let's just focus back on that page for a minute. Um, he, what is he talking about here when he's talking about food and drink? He's talking about the word of God. Notice how he keeps saying listen. So listen, verse 3, that your soul may live. That's the word of God, the promise that gives us eternal life. And what will happen out of that? We will come into that same covenant of David, of God's sure love for us. That's a sure thing that God loves you. Just as I mentioned to the children, God so loved the world. That means you and every person in the world. And then what will happen? Verse 5, a nation you do not know and a nation that did not know you will run to you for this salvation. And that's the way it is with the Chinese world. If you look at just 200 years ago, us Westerners, white people, were very much foreigners to Chinese. We didn't know each other well. Very different cultures. But now, because of the gospel, Chinese have become our brothers and sisters in Christ, the same family. And that's the ones you didn't know. And people will run to you. You see how Chinese are running to America. They're trying to escape from their own country to come here. And um, many are hearing the gospel and becoming believers in America, like my wife, Maggie. In 1995, she came to, went to Houston to study and heard the gospel, became a believer, and was baptized. And at that time, she, in this big family of relatives, when I married her, I got 50 Chinese relatives by marriage and only one Christian among them. That was her. But others have thankfully become um, believers since then and become baptized. So that's an amazing thing the gospel does. It makes nations that don't know us and we don't know them run to us for that gospel. And as I said, the Chinese world is ripe for that gospel now like never before. Let's go to the next slide. Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your, my, your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is so far above us, we can't understand that wonderful grace. Do you see the point about the word? It turns people to repent, just as we did at the beginning of the service. He said, let the wicked forsake his way. 
the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. Return to the Lord who made us. That's what he wants all people to do is to return to him and turn away from evil. Repent. And what happens when we repent? The very thing that happened this morning. And the pastor asked, do you believe this? That you're forgiven and it's a forgiveness of God? He will have compassion on those who repent. And he will abundantly pardon. We can't understand that grace and forgiveness. It doesn't work with our mind which says, I'm a sinner, I should be punished. That's the reasonable thing. But his grace is far beyond us that he took the punishment for us. We can't reason that out and understand it with our minds. We can only receive it by faith, like children, trusting by faith that our Heavenly Father has control of it all. And when he says, I forgive you and I love you even more than you love yourself, it's true. That's how far above us he is. So you may not love yourself much. I sometimes ask, do I like myself? And I've even asked my kids, do you like yourself? Sometimes we may not. But, you know, God likes you. God loves you more than you can imagine. And being filled with that love can also make you love yourself and others. Let's go on to the next one. And finally, the rain and snow are God's word as well. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that's what I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Again, just like food and drink were compared to God's word, rain and snow are God's word. And more than anyone, in Iowa, you know how much rain is needed, right, for the crops. And when that rain comes down, then that cor corn grows tall. Just driving around, we're amazed by it, me and my children, how the science and art of farming has so increased in America here and in Iowa. The fields are so nice and um, the corn is so tall. The beans are so green and um, rich. And I told my children, Remember, this is the bread basket of the world. It's feeding the whole world. You know where a lot of those soybeans go? Out to East Asia, to the Chinese, where they use it to make tofu. All kinds of different kinds of tofu. And every, some key things in their diet. And so that's a blessing that God's blessed America with. Just like to Abraham, he said, I have blessed you to be a blessing. So we need to step forward in being a blessing to others. And the key way is spreading that word. And you see what it says in verse 13, 12 and 13? It's a joyful thing. And it produces not thorns, but the good things, the good fruit in people's lives. So we thank God that we can be a part of that. And I can share with you, after 23 years, I'm motivated more than ever, joyful more than ever to serve. And I hope that um, the young people like Catherine and the rest in the congregation will have that sense of joy in serving. Um, at the end of the day, we come down, we come back to the cross that God forgives us for our sins. And that lifts us up, forgives us, and fills us with a joy. Let's go to the next slide. In the year 46, Paul went from what is today Syria, the, the church of Antioch, and mentions in Acts 13 that they sent out Paul and Barnabas, the first sent out missionaries. And as you can see by my kind of hand-drawn picture, I drew this 
uh, it might not be too clear to some, but that's the whole Asia and um, all, all the way over to Rome. Um, and Paul went toward the west, you can see. He spread the gospel west. And so primarily in the history of the world, the gospel has gone west from um, Antioch through Asia Minor, Greece, Rome, and then he was pressing on to Spain. So it went through y Europe. Most of our ancestors here are from those places in Europe. And that has been blessed by the gospel. And then it went over to America and, and Canada. So um, we're wondering about Asia, India, the rest of the world. Well, in the year 635, a missionary named Alopin also went out from the same place, Syria. Uh, you wouldn't think Syria would be a missionary base, right? If you looked at it today, it's anything but a missionary base. But at that time, God used it, at that time of history, to be a missionary base. And so this missionary went to China to spread the gospel in China in the year 635. Let's go to the next slide. And what they left, these Syrian missionaries at that time, they carved into this stone um, the gospel that they preached, the Trinity, and how many believers there were at that time. I've actually gone to see this stone. It's in the um, western part of China in Xi'an, where all those little soldiers are. You know those terracotta soldiers? Some of you have may, may have been to those, um, see those. But that stone is there, and I've actually gone and seen it. Let's go to the next slide. So that's the first concrete evidence of the gospel being spread in China. And by the year 845, there were at least 3,000 believers in China. But then that gospel was just cut, eradicated from China. When they switch dynasties, a lot of times they just wipe out things from the former dynasty. So next slide. But then, during the Mongolian dynasty, do you know the name Genghis Khan? Genghis Khan was this great conqueror from Mongolia in the northern part of China, and they rode on horses to conquer. They mastered riding on horses and shooting arrows. They would stay on the horse for a whole week, do everything on that horse, use the toilet, eat everything. And they conquered from China all the way to Hungary, the largest swath of earth of an empire ever. But they couldn't hold it very long. But anyway, at that time, John of Monte Corvino went from Europe to spread the gospel there. Next slide. And there were, by the year 1368, 30,000 believers. And a lot of the nobility, the wives of Genghis Khan, were believers. But then another dynasty rose up, conquered these to Chinese foreigners, Mongolians, and they conquered them and wiped out the gospel the second time. Next slide. But then, um, about the time of Martin Luther, right after Martin Luther died, they had the Jesuit missionaries and others like Franciscans and Dominicans that went to China to spread the gospel. And so one of the main missionaries at that time was Matteo Ricci, a Jesuit. And they felt that um, China was almost becoming, gonna become a Christian nation because the emperors were starting to let the Jesuits teach their sons, the next emperors. But then a big controversy developed. It was between the pope and the emperor. And it was all over um, the, the traditional Chinese culture and involved also their ancestor worship. Chinese still to this day are ancestor worshipers. So they believe when their parents die, they become a god, and they can either bless or punish them, and they need to do sacrifices to them. My mother-in-law still does this. And um, I, as I thought of it over all these 23 years, I really came to the conclusion that it's a very reasonable belief. Why do I say reasonable? I say because... In the Bible, it says people are made in the image of God. So of all creation, we are like God. We are like God. And there's so much evidence of this. 
you just take out of your pocket that little powerful computer, cell phone, right? Many of us have a cell phone like an iPhone. Do you know that what you hold in your hand is more powerful than those computers that controlled the Apollo missions to the moon, which had to have big rooms to hold these computers? And what, what monkey has produced that, right? <laughs> Monkeys are not made in the image of God. What rock or plant can do that? None in all of history. So you see there's something really special about humans. They're created in God's image. So for many cultures, like the Chinese culture, to think we actually become gods, I think it's reasonable. But there's a fine line there that we will always, for eternity, be like God, but never become God. We never become the one that is worshipped, only God. Well, at that time, the Pope listened to these very hardline, harsh um, Franciscans and Dominicans, and he just cut them off and said, no, um, Chinese culture is bad and evil, and we're going to say it that way. They've got to become like Westerners to become believers. And actually, the Jesuit missionaries were working on a good solution. It took patience to teach, and it took some shepherding of them. A lot of time people, I, I see even in America, there's so many extremes. People don't have the patience and the commitment and the faithfulness to God's truth and his love to work through it. The hard work that it takes to go through to shepherding people and helping them and gaining true understanding. So what happened is the Pope just cut them off and said they're evil. And that, guess what the emperor of China said? You say we Chinese in our culture is evil? I also excommunicate you, Pope. <laughs> Just like Luther said to the Pope, you excommunicate me, I excommunicate you. So he made Christianity illegal and based on a lot of misunderstanding. And so that was the third time that the gospel went into China and then was attempted to be wiped out. Next slide. But, but they actually had 200,000 believers. By that time, it was made illegal. Next slide. And then the final fourth time the gospel went into China was with the Protestant missionaries starting in about 1800, 200 years ago. And um, next slide. Probably the most well-known missionaries, well, one thing I want to say, they went with warships. And there were some very unequal wars, the opium wars with the Chinese. Um, in Boston, we had Boston Tea Party. Remember that history? about how our forefathers went onto those ships of the tea from the Brit British that was being taxed too much. So they went on the ship and they um, broke open the box of tea, threw them out and burned the ships. Well, the Chinese did something similar with the opium trade. The British were selling opium in China and making a lot of money on the addiction to opium. And interesting thing is, opium was illegal in England. But when a brave Chinese man stood up and did the same thing, burned the opium in the harbor in Hong Kong, the British said, hey, you're taking away our source of income. And they went to war, and they conquered the Chinese and made it very unequal treaties. To this day, Chinese feel hurt by that. And the problem was a lot of the missionaries, when they went to China, went on these warships to protect them. So it's a very conflicting thing, the warships that are bombing their cities to make them opium trade. The missionaries are coming off these. So I think we Lutherans can understand um, a very strong principle in this world that Luther's, you know, found from the Bible. We are saint and sinner. So even in the church and all our businesses and everywhere, we're going to see the sinful effects of people and the good effects. I was recently at the, um, our international center in St. Louis, the Missouri City International Center, and I was introduced to this new um, communications person, and they said, well, he has a lot of, you know, experience in the corporate world. And I said, oh, 
So you're coming from the sinful corporate world into this pure church that has no sin, right? Is that what you believe? I'm just kidding with him. And I said, if you want to see how sin affects not only the corporate world and the world out there, but it also affects the church, um, you just prepare yourself not to be too disappointed. Um, we all know that. You've participated in church events and meetings, and um, you sometimes come to the point of being disappointed. But the key thing is if we can trudge through that, if we can, with God's word, keep going, enduring, God then uses us to bring good fruit out of that. Next slide. So one of the missionaries that was really good, probably the most famous in all, of all missionaries, was James Hudson Taylor. And you see the one picture of him as an Englishman, and in the other, he became like Chinese. He, he wore the Chinese clothes and ate the Chinese food, was criticized by other missionaries for doing that, but he really was able to bring many missionaries into that and to spread the gospel throughout China. Next slide. But uh, the Chinese Christians were growing to, to be one million. There were one million Chinese Christians by the time the communist government, which still China has this communist government, we can't fool ourselves on that. Marxism is against God, and they wanted to get rid of religion. So Mao Zedong, in many of our lifetime, 1966 to 76, had the cultural revolution where he closed every, all the churches, sent the missionaries out. We had, Missouri Senate had a bunch of missionaries in China. They're all kicked out of China. And um, they put in jail and killed the pastors and leaders of the churches. They were trying to eradicate the fourth time. They were trying to get Christianity out of China and persecute the, the spreaders of Christianity. But a miracle happened, a great miracle happened, because throughout history and what's happened in the last 200 years, Chinese have been humbled, and now they're ready to receive the gospel. Next slide. So that a summary is in the Tang, Tang Dynasty, there were 3,000 believers, and then it was wiped out. The Yuan Dynasty, 30,000, then it was wiped out. The third one, 200,000, do you see what it's happening with God's word, it's increasing. Even though people are against it, God's word is increasing. By the fourth one, modern China, there were a million believers in 1980, and then that's the time they reopened the churches in China. And without missionaries, without any missionary organization, without pastors even, Chinese pastors, without any group that could take credit for it, in 43 years up to our day, the Chinese believers grew to 200 million. What percentage of growth is that in one generation? Isn't that amazing? 200% in just 43 years in our lifetime. That's amazing. And um, so that's the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's why we can see the Chinese world is ripe for the gospel. And so thank you for really supporting us and doing that because what you're doing is you're spreading that gospel out there and we're part of it all together. Next slide. Do I have any more slides? Or is it okay? So um, that's the signal for the end of the sermon because uh, it's my final slide. But um, so let me once again thank you for that and then in a few minutes, we, my children will share the music of a Chinese song that tells a wonderful message. We'll put the words up on the board um, as we're listening to that. And we'll be able to hear Isaac, who's 16, the violin, Gary, who's 14, play the cello, and then Ginny, who's 11, almost 12, play the piano. So let's um, have faith in God's word and continue forward with that despite all the troubles in the world. Amen. Thank you, Professor Oliver. Uh, here's what, as we transition to, our, uh, to the Apostles' Creed, if it's helpful for you to go ahead and get your instruments set up while we're doing the creed, you can certainly come up and start getting set up.
because during the offering which follows the creed, then we'll have the song. So if you want to uh, come forward, you can. Uh, let us stand. And with joy and confidence, we confess together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You can come forward for your peace, and children will gather your offering at this time too. supposed to start? Yeah. Yeah. Can you start now?
thank you, Isaac and Gary and Jenny. Truly beautiful, and uh, the words that accompany it are uh, just marvelous. Thank you for sharing. We stand to pray. Lord God, we give you thanks that your word first has reached our ears and by the working of your spirit has opened faith in us so that we might know Christ as Lord. We thank you that you have sent missionaries like Professor Oliver into the the Chinese world and that he is a part of this this great effort to bring your word into the lives of our friends on the other side of the world. And we pray that that word may go forward, that it may may reach ears and hearts, that it may produce a, a, a harvest to your glory. Raise up more missionaries and those who will support missionaries, that we may continue to send that word into the heart of the people of China and beyond. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Lyle Munt, Tanya Jacobson, John Bexton, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Justine Schwizo, Sherry Steffes, Corey Aronson, Tom Wagner, Susan Lamb, Juanita Kurth, Kristen Webb, Linus Borkowski, Bob Christensen, Bruce Rutz, and Steve Rutz. We pray that you would give each of these individuals grace sufficient for each day to face the trials before them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We celebrate with Joey Eichmann, who was baptized yesterday into the body of Christ. May he and all of us baptized into Christ daily die to sin and rise to new life in Jesus and look forward to the day of being joined in Christ's resurrection as Christ returns to raise the dead and renew the earth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who mourn, we think especially of the family of Rosora Schrader. We ask that you would bring comfort to her family and comfort to all who grieve, that they may find hope in the promises of Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our pastors and missionaries and cross-cultural worker, that you may continue to empower them and embolden them to confess Christ. We pray especially for Professor Oliver, that you may equip him for the work set before him, that you may give him and his family the joy of Jesus and the courage to confess Christ where you have called them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our law enforcement and military men and women, that they may be protected from harm. For our preschool, that it may be strengthened to share Christ with children. For our partnership with Trinity in Manila, that this partnership may be invigorated, that we may continue to share Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the people of Ukraine, we pray for peace. We pray for the restoration of livelihoods and for the opening of doors for the gospel. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for our national convention coming up in a couple weeks, that the resolutions we adopt would be pleasing to you, Lord, and enable the work of the church to continue and to be strengthened and the gospel of the kingdom to go forward. These prayers we pray in the name of Jesus, and at his command and invitation, we are bold to pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated. Before we get to our last hymn, a couple quick things for us. One, we're hoping to start up Professor Oliver's presentation. Give us about 15 minutes or so and then gather over in the Bible class area. We'd love to welcome you for that. Uh, My tech team i.e. my children, I need you to grab the laptop out of the office and get that turned on and set up with the HDMI in it. Perfect. Okay, and the last one I have, um, word may have gotten out, Professor Oliver, that you're celebrating a birthday tomorrow, and there may have been some cards produced and delivered, and you may have cards yet you didn't get into the basket. But I'm going to share these with you. I'm not going to read them all now. And we're not going to sing happy birthday. But you are certainly encouraged to tell him happy birthday, which is tomorrow. 
And you can ask him how old he is. But nonetheless, we're so excited to celebrate having you here and happy birthday. So I'm going to deliver these to you while we turn to our last song.